one of the things I feel like I need to explain to them all the time is like, I'm not teaching you this arm bar. I'm not teaching you this wrist lock because they are magic secret sauce that is going to overcome all things. What's going on, everybody? Welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 670. My guest today coming back to the show, Sergeant Jason Hamilton. If you don't know my name, maybe this is your first episode. I'm Jeremy Lesniak. I'm a host for the show, founder here at Whistlekick, where everything we do is in support of the traditional martial arts. If you want to see everything we're doing, check out the newly redesigned whistlekick.com. You're going to find everything we've got going on over there, including our store. One of the ways that we monetize what we do. Yes, we sell some stuff, and there's some good stuff. And if you find some good stuff that you want to pick up, well, you can use the code PODCAST15 to get yourself 15% off. The show has its own website, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. We bring you the show twice a week, and the goal of the show, and really of Whistlekick overall, well, it's to connect, educate, and entertain traditional martial artists throughout the world. If you want to support the work that we do, you can do a number of things. You can make a purchase, share an episode, follow us on social media. We're at Whistlekick everywhere, you can imagine. You could tell a friend about us, maybe pick up one of our books on Amazon, leave a review on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google, Facebook, you name it. Or you could support our Patreon, patreon.com slash whistlekick. That's a place where we post exclusive content. And if you contribute as little as $2 a month, you're going to get some access. At 2 bucks a month, we're going to tell you who's coming up on the show. At $5, you're getting bonus audio, and it goes up from there. It is very rare that people stop contributing to the Patreon. And at least part of that is because we deliver incredible value. If you have not checked out what is available at Patreon, please go check it out. Patreon.com slash whistlekick. It's not going to cost you anything to take a look. So go take a look and help ensure that this show sticks around. Back on episode 579, Andrew and I talked with Sergeant Jason Hamilton about appropriate use of force. There were some things coming out in the media, and there were conversations about how much force was appropriate in the martial arts community. Andrew knew Sergeant Hamilton, reached out, we brought him on the show, and it was a great conversation. Well, today we bring him back to do something we, I don't think we've done more than once or twice. A guest who came on for a topic is back to give us their story. And Sergeant Hamilton does just that. He tells us about his early passion for martial arts and how he ultimately ended up in law enforcement. And of course, we talk a lot about the overlap and what all of us as non-law enforcement officers can learn from his experience as such. Stick around, great conversation, and I'll see you in the outro. Sergeant Hamilton, welcome back to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Hey, how's it going? Good Good afternoon. Good afternoon to you. You know, I, I was thinking, just as I was saying, welcome back. It is very, very rare that we do things in kind of the order we've done with you. You came on 579, so just about 100 episodes ago, to talk about a subject. But now we're bringing you on to tell you tell your story. Usually we do the opposite. We've got plenty of examples of doing the opposite. So thanks for letting us do things out of order. Uh, it's perfectly fine. I mean, I... Uh... I feel like we had uh, a little bit of an intro to sort of who I am and what my background was last time, but uh, I'm happy to talk in more detail about myself. I mean, not to sound egotistical, but I'm pretty interesting. So You've done some cool stuff, yeah. Uh, I was, was hoping for some derisive laughter there. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, there are only two of us here, and it, and if... If I'm laughing at you, that that doesn't leave much of a, a a live audience to to temper out that energy. Yeah, yeah, I suppose we, so. we've got to wait at least twenty minutes before I start picking on you. Okay, okay. If we do that at the top, who knows where this is going to go? Yeah, my my friends start in early and often with the with the picking on me, so uh, I, I can relate. We we have we know people in common. I'm I'm sure it's it's happening all across. Yeah, yeah. Well, last time, when we had you on before, we were talking about, um, I forget what we titled that episode, Reasonable Use of Force, was that Yeah. what we called it? I know that was the subject matter. Yeah. Uh, we spoke a lot about the, um, 
laws and um, sort of the, the legal processes around uh, use of force and um, self-defense. Now, we may very well may have some people, probably a, a bunch of people who have not listened to that episode. So mm. let's start here. I introduced you as Sergeant. Uh, yep. You just said the word laws. Mm. You must be in law enforcement. I am. I am a sergeant, which is a first line supervisor for a uh, municipal police department in uh, Vermont. Mm -hmm. right and you are also a martial artist. Yep. Uh, so I was on uh, with you and Andrew the last time Andrew and I came up in a uh, very similar uh uh, we came up in the same dojo in the same lineage of um, Okinawan karate and jujitsu. Uh, I started with um, Sensei Donahue in 2001, uh, I believe 2001, 2002 uh, there. So I'm a little bit uh, ahead of Andrew in terms of my sort of my total time in that. Um, but yeah, we came up in uh, exactly the same lineage. From there, um, uh, life's taken me in a lot of different directions. Um, after I graduated from college, I moved to Japan. And so there was a fairly significant amount of training there in some other and unrelated martial arts styles. Why? Um, well, <clears throat> it, it, it sounds like there's a story there. Oh, well, so the story about going to Japan was just, well, it was a number of things. I was really, really, really into martial arts stuff. And uh, that's turned into my degree in college. I majored in uh, Japanese history and martial arts, the martial arts um, that I was practicing uh, uh, with Sensei Donahue was my um, was sort of half of my graduating project. And uh, as part of that, my professors, the college that I was attending, um, forced me to uh, study Japanese. And uh, I was terrible at it, as I have been terrible at every foreign language that I've attempted all throughout my life. Uh, I learned French, grade school, middle school, and high school, 11 total years, and can't speak at all, never could, <laughs> um, never really got it. Um, but they insisted, and I, I sat down and took the classes and uh, was pretty terrible at it, uh, as we predicted. But um, I just, it just became so frustrating that I, I couldn't. I couldn't get it um, that uh, I decided that when I graduated, I would move to Japan and I would um, get fluent or die trying, essentially. Mm. So after graduating college, I took a job as an English teacher over there and started started studying. Um, obviously, martial arts being a big part of my background to that point. Uh, as soon as I got to Japan, I started seeking out whatever training opportunities I could um, with uh, Sensei Donahue's blessing there. And uh, uh, not a lot of it was particularly well directly related to what I, I had been learning in America, but um, I mean, it's all sort of related somewhere back there, I guess. And we uh, I sort of restricted to uh, places around the areas that I could reasonably get to with the amount of time off yeah. that I had. I, I was still working to support myself. I, I could not uh, afford to become just a, a live-in uh, deshi at a, at a dojo someplace and make that my whole life. Um, so, well, in, in part, I guess, afford and in part just visa things you don't you know just get to stay in japan because you feel like training martial arts um they have a pretty strict visa um system so um it was just sort of training as i could train 
Um, so that was uh, Iaido, which is maybe the thing that I, I was able to do the most consistently. Um, an Aikido group, which was pretty close by. And uh, Kendall for about two of the years I was there kind of on and off. All right. There's, I'm, I'm trying to find the question to ask here because you're, you're talking about this training in a very different way. Just even even the the tone in your voice. There's a very different way that you're talking about this than you you talk. You, even though it was briefly about your other training, is that is it because it was intermittent or was there something? Is there something else? Was was there? Were you not finding what you wanted? Um. <sighs> That is an interesting question. So not, yeah, I think you're hitting on something there. Uh, I wasn't directly finding what I wanted. Um, there was certainly a lot of uh, cultural importance to um, especially uh, the Aido and Kendo that I, I was getting to practice. Um, and I had a great time doing it and uh, learned a lot about uh, Japanese sword that way. Um, helped uh inform uh my understanding of japanese history which you know since college is really more of a, a hobby than it is you know i've never made money studying history or teaching it um but none of it was particularly uh practically self-defense oriented and to that point my, my martial arts journey had been much more focused on um, practical techniques and uh, conditioning for the here and now, for you know my life as I was living it. So while sort of um, engaging in the sport of kendo was a lot of fun, and the uh, sort of costumed, ritualed study of some of the tradition of Japanese sword, both informative about um, a culture that I've been studying, but don't really have a ton of, you know, real world ability to, to touch, taste and feel mm -hmm. um, was, was really great. It didn't, it didn't have the same sense um, of, immediacy that the training that uh that i've been i've been doing up to that point did the the training prior the training here in the states had you sought out training of that kind or was that luck of the draw oh well so i've been interested in martial arts since i was very very little I come from a, a family of pacifists and uh that didn't really work for me it didn't make sense uh from a practical standpoint uh, from a philosophical standpoint, I didn't, I didn't really agree with it. It never worked for me. <clears throat> so um, my opportunities to engage with that material were very, very limited. And um, sort of as, as I got older, I was uh, being a little bit more rebellious, not just in, you know, how I was thinking about this or talking about it, but actually being able to take some affirmative action on my own to, to study martial arts. Um, I was sort of limited to, again, what was going on around me. And I, I studied, uh, I had a, a martial arts teacher that was coming to the high school that I went to uh, and teaching mm -hmm. classes. And I was, I was always involved in those or as much as I could be. Um, I went to I have a very sort of long winding journey through college and uh, the first college that I went to, I, I attended kind of a martial arts circle, but um, it had all kind of wound down. People weren't as serious about it. Um, the people that I had access to weren't as serious about it uh, as I think I needed. And so um, I encountered Sensei Donahue uh, teaching at another college that I went to, and um, it was immediately the level of uh, attention to detail 
uh, enthusiasm for um, the the culture and the history of it, as well as uh, the etiquette, the surrounding it, and the sort of um, I don't know the philosophical aspects of yeah. martial arts. Um, what, what I'm what I'm hearing is is there was something. Let me back up. Over the course of years and hundreds of interviews, I've gotten a pretty good sense, just in the way someone talks about a school, whether or not they landed a school that was the right school for them at that time. Doesn't mean that that doesn't change, but it sounds very clear that, fortunately, this school you landed at just resonated with you. I can hear it in the tone of your voice when you talk about it. Yeah, no, 100%. It was something that I was waiting to find that I didn't know that I was waiting to find. Mm. It was a, a level of energy input and discipline uh, around physical movement and conditioning and um, martial arts that I hadn't had to that point and um, didn't know that I was lacking, if that makes sense. Didn't know that I hadn't, I hadn't, uh, that my enthusiasm for martial arts had waned because of the lack of that. I, it, it was something that I did not grasp until I ran across Sensei Donahue and um, was immediately in love with these classes and immediately in love with his teaching style and um, the the practicality of what we were learning and the philosophical background of it and uh, just everything about it really resonated with me and so throughout the next what was that 2001 um i graduated in early 2006 um and that's when i also uh, attained my shodan so over the next five years much of that time uh I, I was somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 or 25 hours a week in the dojo. Wow. Yeah. Um, just like totally immersed nerd level. Um, couldn't really get through life comfortably without having that input and was really blowing off a lot of, <laughs> a lot of other things that, um, other people at least thought were very important at the time in order to do that. Um, yeah. By the time I was graduating, I was like, I was blowing up, like I, I wasn't working a full-time job. Um, I, was, I took out student loans that I probably didn't need in order to uh, not have to work too much. Mm -hmm. uh, going through my last year of college, and the reason that I, I didn't afford myself enough time to work enough to support myself was because I needed to be in the dojo. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, I, so I, I've got to ask, when, when you chose to go to Japan, this couldn't have been an easy decision. No. No, um, but it became an inevitability pretty quickly. So uh, there was a moment kind of, I'd just been pushed into Japanese classes and uh, my, uh, my, my, my final project for school, which was still about two and a half years away from being completed, um, even, even in their timeline there, and it took me longer than that. Uh, was uh, there was this moment where okay well I'm gonna go to Japan for a semester or something like that and that's gonna kind of get me over the hump here and I couldn't do it I couldn't make it um, work financially like none of the pieces of that plan ever came together and I just, I realized kind of coming back to my studies after expending all of this effort into trying to get the study abroad 
thing to happen, which never did, that um, I could get through what I was supposed to get through in college without going, but I, my study was never going to be complete. And it just became this kind of slow rolling, inevitable thing where no, I mean, I'm, I'm never going to be good enough in this language living here. Like it's just, it's just never going to happen. So I, uh, it wasn't something, wasn't something anybody around me wanted uh, for me. It was pretty scary. Um, it's a lot of like preparation and like putting affairs in order that I, I didn't do a great job of all the time. Um, but, okay. but it was just, it was inevitable. Why did you come back? I promised my mom that I'd come back. Um, the most upset person about all of this and this stuff, at least ongoing, was was my mother. As, so I kind of had to lay out a plan for her. Like, I need to go to Japan. It's certain that I'm going to be there. I don't know how long fluency is going to take. I don't know what this is going to require of me. Um, I don't even know how I'm going to measure this exactly. But uh, when that is done, when I've hit whatever, whatever benchmark I can come up with, I will come back. And uh, so after I got there, um, it was immediately like, find places where Japanese people congregate and hang out there. So a lot of going to bars. Uh, Japanese teachers involve myself in as many martial arts as I can, as I, I can make time for. Um, and study, you know, during, during the, my other hours. And uh, uh, the the school that I was teaching at was a private um, sort of after school for kids English teaching house uh, and a, I don't know a fair number of the people that worked there I would say maybe maybe thirty or forty percent were studying Japanese actively and they were all um, taking a they're measuring their success uh, by taking a, a test that was a sort of nationally recognized test for foreigners for Japanese language ability. And there was like levels up from four, three, two, one. And so I very quickly set my sights on, well, if I can pass the, the top level of this test, um, that will be that will be enough. They don't they don't make a harder test for foreigners Japanese ability so that'll mean that I can read and write and speak and listen uh, well enough to to communicate with with anybody in the country so um, that's where I set my sights um, actually getting there took me the better part of four years mm. um, and uh, so we sort of reached the reached the moment where um, I now have to start to look to the promise that I made to my my folks that I would come home. So from there, um, I was kind of up in the air. Like, what am I? I was a teacher, you know, I, I had been teaching English and I, I went on to teach um, in a high school. Great job, just tons of free time, a lot of coworkers that I really got along well with and um, a great culture and um, free time at work to 
practice martial arts, um, to lift weights, uh, pursue other hobbies, translation and that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. So it would have been pretty hard to pry me away from there, but I actually on a trip back visiting the States, um, I knew that I was kind of preparing to come home, but with the sort of momentum that you've built up in a particular job for a particular time where you, you have the schedules and you know what's going to happen at this time and that time and this day of that week and that sort of stuff. Um, I, I could definitely have seen myself getting stuck, just grinding out day after day after day. But I, I came back uh, over a summer vacation and uh, I went back to my dojo and I met with Sensei and just sat and talked for God, an hour, hour and a half after a uh, class that he taught. And uh, he reminded me that I had been interested in law, that um, to the point of me moving to Japan, to that, that point in my life, um, the sort of academic pursuits and just studying and practicing and training martial arts weren't really enough in my mind um, that I, I wanted some more real world experience and that I wanted to um, find a way to contribute to the, to the world that um, used some of those skills. So mm. he sort of like... Okay. He put that back on my my plate I'm like what what happened to this because i at that point you know years in japan fluent in japanese uh a bachelor's from pretty good college and you know that all that stuff stacked up just sort of looking like well why don't i go to some sort of graduate school and become a professor and uh sensei was pretty pretty harsh with me he was pretty clear with me like that sounds that doesn't sound like what you want that doesn't sound like where you were looking to go with your life and that i mean it's using some of the skills that you've come across here but uh it's not the real you i don't think so i kind of took that home to japan with me um, and mold it over and started applying to, um, to, to police jobs, started sort of looking into what that was going to require. I had done some of the steps of, um, initial hiring processes, um, before, but, uh, so I, I had some experience with it. But I sort of got further into that and I was almost like applying, applying, almost on board um, and like ready to be headed home. My wife was applying for a visa and uh, a friend that I had made at the English teaching school that I was at um, who had, he <laughs> from Hawaii, he had gone back home to get his master's in Japanese business and had been mm -hmm. since then interning at Reebok in Japan, comes to me and says, hey, um, I know you CrossFit and you, you do this training, the, the physical training, and you speak Japanese. What would you say to helping us open a gym? And uh, so... <laughs> They sort of wrote me back in for a year <laughs> or two. Uh, well, it's just absolute dream job, right? Like, oh, so we're going to pay you. We're going to pay you more money than you've you've ever gotten before at any job. Um, more money than you're getting right now by like fifty percent. And um, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna pay for a whole bunch of certifications in um, CrossFit stuff I'm already doing mm -hmm. and then you're gonna run a, a physical training program for us in a gym that we're opening 
it's sort of hard to say no. Um, so I, yeah. I, stayed, I stayed an extra year after that. We were really on point of coming home and I stayed an extra year after that sort of, we got the gym open and that's when I, I headed back and, uh, sort of got all the way into to police work. Was that an easy transition? Uh, I don't mean physically or logistically, but uh, emotionally? It, it sounds like, you know, even though we started talking about Japan from this angle that there was, there was a piece missing, it's also clear that there was, a, there was a piece missing that you went there to find. And it sounds like you found it. You know, yeah, you, you, you talked about this, this job, this gym job, where it checked a lot of boxes and they threw some good money at you. But I didn't get the sense that you took it reluctantly. No, no. I mean, it was, it was impossible to say no. Like I, while in Japan, I went pretty far down the rabbit hole of um, health, nutrition uh, and fitness, which uh, had sort of come to me, uh, or come to be for me another part of self-defense is sort of when I, I was living in Japan and uh, I was in three and at times four different martial arts practices depending on when everybody met and at what various gyms and if I could make it on my little bicycle and not get run over. Um, but I was gaining weight. Um, it was pretty fat for uh, a little bit there. And it just like occurred to me that my fitness level was a hole in my game and my, my general basic level of, of, of strength and just sort of capacity was another hole in my game. Um, both, I mean, at the time, I think I was probably younger and still thinking in terms of like well yeah i mean being being strong is a pretty big advantage like, like if i could be stronger i would be stronger there's really no it doesn't take anything off the table um so uh i was i, I became very very involved in trying to lose weight and that led me down this whole rabbit hole of food and sleep and just uh, a bunch of sort of self-experimentation. And then um, that uh, that also sort of shunted me towards different ways of thinking about exercise and that, uh, that tied up with CrossFit. Um, and so those were, you know, that stuff was, became a big passion of mine. Um, and yeah, I mean, I was, I was kind of in the thick of it, maybe, maybe sort of cresting past the ultimate peak of my, of my interest in that stuff, but mm -hmm. still, you know, very, very involved and very sort of sucked into, uh, setting personal records in the back squat and, uh, you know, running uh cone drills faster than i had before and that sort of stuff i i i do know i, I don't i don't know if you know I, I went i also went pretty deep on crossfit for about a decade awesome i i also held a quite a number of, of crossfit certifications put a lot of time and money into that and found a lot of synergy with martial arts and um they folks who are who are listening who are familiar with the training programs that we've developed came 100 percent from where i saw those things intersecting mm. yeah uh it's i mean we I don't, I don't know that we need to like spend a whole bunch of time on this but yeah i was i was super amazed on how um tied how well crossfit tied itself to um exactly what martial arts conditioning uh really was um was after really qualities that martial arts the kind of conditioning you get in a dojo is after i was i was just a 
it it uh that was sort of its latches into me I'm like oh so being generally physically prepared you know for a whole bunch of different tasks yeah that sounds like kind of what i'm after here yeah exactly so no i can i um if i can ask what what certifications uh did you hold obviously other than the level one oh geez uh one two olympic gymnastics mm. Oh, there was one more in there. Defense. Oh, was that um? The power Lauer, yeah, yeah, awesome. That's awesome. I um, tried to do striking, but I was the only. There was a very brief window where there was a CrossFit striking program, and <laughs> I was all signed up and had my flight and everything. And they called me and they're like, "So we've canceled the program. They canceled the class." And I was like, "But, but why?" And I was like, "Well, you're the only one who signed up." So I was like, "Oh." <laughs> sad <laughs> so i made my own. it was fun awesome um yeah i they they sent me they paid for me and sent me paid for my flight and all that stuff to go down to open nice. to get my level one but we didn't really do much else in terms of certification um some judges stuff and and the sort of else uh they needed for me and some of the guys that i was working with to teach in the gym but, but not much more let's possibly fast forward a hair because mm. you 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 set this you kind of kind of foreshadowed a little bit yeah. you were sitting with your sensei here in the u.s and he brought up the law and you start you said you started applying for law enforcement jobs and you know we already talked at the top i called you sergeant and we kind of <laughs> kind of gave it away yeah that at some point you found your way in there so what, what did what did that transition into that career look like well um i couldn't i couldn't apply for you can't apply for um law enforcement jobs except in person it, there's okay. no remote stuff there's no remote test taking that you can do there's no like none of that stuff is they need to see you do the push-ups they need to see you look you in the eye across the table uh, they need to watch you do even the, the, the written test. They want to, you know, monitor you and proctor you, and, um, you know, the psychological testing, all of that stuff. You can't do a polygraph over the phone. So I had to move back to the States. And that was super tough transition, really culture shock. I'd been back, yeah, about once a year, twice every three years kind of thing for the seven years that i was in japan but um still like being here all the time it's not just you're not a tourist where all the roads are wide and the mountains are off in the distance and stuff you're you're actually now like back here living and trying to make trying to make it all work um so there's a significant amount of culture shock there and um my wife uh, couldn't come with me when I moved because um, it was just like all of a sudden the year was over and we hadn't continued uh, her visa process. So she had a whole bunch of wind down stuff with the uh, the company that she was working for that she had to do and she had to get her, her visa squared away, which she had to stay in Japan for. So I had about six months here uh she visited once um before she she moved and uh yes yeah, just throughout that time i was doing more crossfit training so training people at a local gym and uh teaching um just teaching as a substitute teacher and uh using those things to keep some money coming in while I applied to police jobs and police uh, application, the, the application uh, process for police officers itself is incredibly long. So we've got, you've got always some sort of in-person paper test, generally uh, some sort of, you know, basic logic, reading comprehension, math skills, that sort of stuff. Um, physical tests, which is just, you know, a battery of 
standard um, Cooper fitness standard stuff. So bench press on a machine and some push-ups and some sit-ups and some running. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, uh, from there, the reschedule you come in another day, potentially weeks down the road to do an oral board, um, which is uh, which is essentially an interview, but sort of like uh, uh, I put you on the spot, really you kind of interview. Uh, and then your weeks out from there to uh, meeting with the person doing your background investigation. Um, and they ask you a bunch of questions. You go away, they bring you back, ask, ask you a bunch more questions. Uh, and eventually you get polygraph on that. So it's it's a long, long, long process to actually uh, being hired as a police officer. So I spent all of that time um, muddling about through whatever other odd jobs, mostly the substitute teaching and, and um, uh, training people in, gym, in the gym. Uh, but was eventually hired. Um, we, I... I must have taken, gosh, I don't know, six, seven of these tests. So the PT test and um, and the, the written test I was invited back. Uh, Massachusetts is sort of a complicated one. It was just a written test. And then um, your test scores go out to all sorts of PDs. And if someone wants you, wants to start talking to you more, they call you. Mm -hmm. But everywhere else was written test, physical test. Cool. Um, all right, come back to your oral boards. Um, must have been like six six different processes until I was eventually hired by somebody. And off to the races we go, so to speak. Right. Now, you know, you, you mentioned what that testing looks like and, and just from conversations we've had on this show and friends that I've had in various uh, law enforcement positions there's very little done or really to my knowledge no combatives evaluation before being hired that stuff happens as part of your training protocol yep yeah no so I can imagine yeah. coming in with the, all the experience that you had that was probably both an asset but also a liability because I'm guessing they wanted you to do things in a certain way that maybe was counter to what you had experienced and understood. Yep. So, um, right. Uh, huh, how do I how do I go out go about explaining this? Yeah, I started with uh, I started with a fairly extensive martial arts background. I was then a need on in our karate style and I was you know stuck at an academy with once a week eight hour um combatives I guess you'd say or or um use of force uh classes and uh I mean at that point in, with the the amount of experience that I had, um, nothing they were teaching was new, but a lot of it was done in some very, very uh, sort of bizarre ways or ways that I, I wasn't used to seeing very often. And then, um, you know, you sort of revert to your training habits. And uh, there was, there was a, a steep learning curve for me to unlearn the kind of basic movements and relearn them in a pattern that was going to suit them well enough. Can, can you give an example? Um, so I don't want people to take this too generally. My, um, I work with the approved use of force or non-lethal use of force curriculum for the state of Vermont. Mm -hmm. So um, 
in that curriculum, there is an armbar takedown, an EQ um, for you know an Aikido practitioner or uh, uh, a traditional Japanese jujitsu practitioner. Um, but just a lot of the principles are uh, the principles are all, of course, exactly the same. But um, where we're putting this hand versus that hand. Um, we're going to do X, Y, and Z differently. Uh, the movement is different. Your foot is going to be here relative to their foot, and there relative to that foot. This ends up on the ground over here, not over there, that sort of thing. Um, was sort of tough, right? Because I, I learned EQ from a, a very particular perspective yeah. that was sort of more an exploration of um, the way it was taught in a couple of different uh, jujitsu and Aikido practices and um, had a lot more open-endedness to it where with, I mean, and with all police uses of force, like there is a, a defined endpoint here. We are getting to a very particular position and we are using that to handcuff people. <laughs> um, essentially, the end is the person's got to be in handcuffs. There's no, like, there's no other ending here. We're not. Um, I learned, you know, a, a million and one different finishes for people on the ground uh, that were from various styles. And nope, for, for police work, we're just going from whatever situation we started in to this person being in handcuffs and so some of the steps to that point and even carrying handcuffs and where the handcuffs are going to be located and how you're going to access them how you need to hold them uh all have a fairly substantial influence on uh the techniques that you're using even if the principles are the same mm. okay i can get that yeah. Um, I mean, I, I took to it. Like, I, it shouldn't. I feel like people might get an, the impression that uh, being a martial artist was somehow a disadvantage. Um, that's not what I'm getting. I mean, maybe somebody out there is thinking that, but that's not. What, what, what I'm hearing is this is in your thought process anyway, kind of this intersection of a whole bunch of things that you were passionate about. Yes, that is certainly true. Um, that is certainly true. And to sort of jump back towards the, the motivations around uh, being in police work, I was, um, I, I just started with a lot of criticisms of, of police work that I'd seen to that point in my life. I felt like police were frequently um, unnecessarily authoritative, condescending, rude, uh, mean, um, sort of, in my experience, uh, had been unnecessarily kind of robotic and inhuman. And um, I felt like, well, that really could be done better than it's being done. And if, well, if you've thinking that, first of all, self-reflection, you don't know what's going on with these things or why the police officers are doing the things the way they're doing them. Like, you're not a police officer. You don't have any of that experience or any of the background in it to really be judgmental. So maybe instead of, maybe if you're going to have criticisms, you ought to learn what's actually going on there and see about, uh, see whether or not you still have those criticisms when you're done learning what's actually going on. And then two, if I have these criticisms and I remain with these criticisms, well, I still think police work is necessary in the world. And if I think it's an important job that could be improved, why don't I put my money where my mouth is? And I couldn't think of a reason not to sort of married up with um, some of the attributes I thought that I had, think that I have. And uh, 
yeah, it just sort of took off from there. Just put your money where your mouth is, man. Through this time, were you doing any, let's call it traditional martial arts training? So you're speaking of my time in the academy? Yeah. yeah. What, what I'm wondering is if, you know, because before you went to Japan, 25 hours a week. Yeah. And this, this approach, this academy, this um, use of force stuff, I mean, you, you gave some examples of where it's conflict might be too strong of a word, but it's, they're not one in the same. Mm-hmm. And I'm wondering where your, your thought process, at least on what you had done historically as traditional arts, how that kind of fit into the mix. Um, well, so, I mean, I, I did and do continue to appreciate, um, the martial arts, I think um, the world of self-defense. How do I put this? It's 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 a lot more complicated, and there's a lot more to it than basic line police officers are learning in an academy setting. Like it's all well and good for us to have this incredibly broad, diverse curriculum of movements for people that are attending a martial arts school two, five, 10 hours a week, but uh, it's, that's not practical for police officers that have to work and use the stuff on a daily basis have to abide by legal strictures. And so like some, some techniques uh, are not going to be uh, practical from a, a legal, not gonna be legal essentially, um, not practical to learn from a legal standpoint because of the restrictions on your ability to use them. Some of them are not gonna be practical because of gear and equipment, right? It's not, we're not just in trunks, you know, slap kicking each um, or in a gi, we're you know walking around with a lot of, of stuff. Um, not all of it, a very little of it, really uh, directly related to any kind of non lethal use force martial arts type, type, type movements. Um, so the use of force curriculum for police officers is very very pared down and um, reflects things that we think we can safely teach officers to do that they will uh, develop a reasonable level of confidence confidence and competence with um, that that are going to keep them safe and keep them um, from really unnecessarily hurting people uh, in the performance of their duties. Mm. So, traditional martial arts and traditional martial artists have a much, much broader um, I don't know exactly how I want to say this, much broader uh, world that, that we're inhabiting. Yeah, um, sure. There's a, there's a, a just a whole world of movements that don't make sense for police officers, wouldn't be legal for police officers to use, or we're just not confident that, you know, guys that are mandated four hours of use of force training a year mm. are really going to ever be, have enough training to be good at, good at. I mean, there's very basic handcuffing techniques that I, I can't seem to get my guys to do correctly. We have some training scars where like, We've we've done it wrong enough times that I didn't die that time, so I'm going to do it again now. Um, and just not enough, not enough hours, not enough time under tension to really uh, alter some of those pathways. Okay, it's one of the things I, I feel like I have to explain to uh, my students. My students now are are uh, police officers, and I'm teaching them the use of force curriculum. Uh, one of the things I feel like I need to explain to them all the time is like, I'm not teaching you this arm bar. I'm not teaching you this wrist lock. 
because they are magic secret sauce that is going to overcome all things. And if your technique is absolutely perfect, you're going to make this work no matter who the other person is. A lot of them come to it with, oh, that's never going to work on me. It's, there's a lot of sort of macho, big, tough kind of uh, perspective on it. And uh, I have to remind them, I'm actually teaching you this so that you have something that you can do to restrain the out of control 11 year old with a knife without getting caught and without breaking them. You can restrain grandma who's out of control swinging her chair around or something without breaking her. If the concern is not, I'm going to break this person, but rather this person is going to break me. We're not like most of the, the stuff that we use on a daily basis is, is it's not going to be there. We're going to be um, raising our, our level of force quite a bit and starting to use tools and that sort of thing. Did I, did I get kind of far afield? I sort of feel like I, uh, I wandered a little bit there. Um, it's, it's a, it's a wandering topic, it right? Is. Because I, I, I've not been in the shoes that you're in. So the yeah. questions that I'm, I'm throwing at you aren't coming from a place of being informed. They're coming from a place of wondering. Yeah. Yeah. So you're, you're, you're doing, you're doing just fine. You're, you're doing okay. great. And of course, you know, to, to wrap it back around, you know, we, we talked pre-show, we talked I don't, the last time you and I talked, we yep. talked even a bit at the beginning, that this is, this is a sh- subject where your passion lies. You know, we, we've kind of gone in, in a number of different directions, but I think we had to get there for people to fully understand why not only you are passionate about doing this work, teaching this subject matter to law enforcement Mm. but why you were able to come at it with a a different perspective yeah i was having a conversation with someone i think it was on i don't know if it was on an episode or anyway it was recent and we we've said this before there are two kinds of people there are people who advance martial arts and there are people who pass on martial arts but you could apply that to any subject matter any material that one learns. Yeah. I would imagine most people who are teaching the things that you are teaching are simply passing them on. They're taking what has been given to them. They are giving them to officers. Officers hope that it works when they need it. But you came in with a whole different body of understanding and are bringing in your own, I don't know how much leeway they give you, but I cannot imagine that your own ideas and experience aren't informing at least how you're presenting this information. Oh, no, absolutely. Absolutely. And um, that attention to the principles, you know, so um, <clears throat> I was in the academy learning to do an arm bar in a way or with a, a number of steps that I, I hadn't practiced connecting before. Um, and with sort of very particular performance demands involving what direction your toes are pointing and that sort of thing that I hadn't had before, but I had the principle. And so moving forward, having adapted uh, my movement style to what uh, my teachers in those classes wanted, um, now with me teaching, I can go back to my students and <clears throat> present an arm bar like, hey, we're doing this and these are the steps and you learn the steps in the academy and I'm going to remind you of all the steps. And the principal thing that we're doing here is this. It's, it's here and here and it can be adapted to your situation a little bit more fluidly than you're thinking. It's sort of uh, showing students the, the underlying principles was one of the was the thing maybe maybe the most central thing that since i donahue did for me that uh re-engaged me in seeing the stuff where it wasn't just a series of kata and break Mm. it was this is what it is this is what it means and even those movements with uh the extra 
meaning being taught to you, uh, even sort of beyond that, here's what the principle is. Here's what happens to your muscular skeletal system when it is twisted in this direction, for example. Uh, and being able to pass on in that fashion, I think, is a lot more, it gives students a, a much better base for understanding what they're doing. Not just rope, not just monkey see, monkey do. It's not just athletics. There's a decent amount of crossover between martial arts and law enforcement. We've had plenty of folks on over the years. Yeah. But the fact is most of the folks listening to this, this show aren't and never will be law enforcement. Yeah. So let me ask what I know you know is not a disrespectful question, but if someone, if this is the first time they're listening, they're going to think it is. Why should the average martial artist care about appropriate use of force? I mean, if you don't care about using the force that you are learning about appropriately, why are you doing this in the first place? Like, you could say, and I'm sure maybe there's there's somebody out there listening who's like, no, I, I just I just want to kick butt, man. Um, I want to learn to kick butt. Like that's it. There's no there's no other center to this. I don't really give a hoot about the rest of the world. But if, if you don't uh, care about how force is being used, you don't care whether or not it's being used appropriately, you're kind of the bad guy. I, I hate to I hate to break this to, to everybody, but like if there's no <clears throat> there's no care about um, whether or not the stuff is being being used appropriately, we're probably not even talking about defense anymore, right? Because self defense is right in there, self defense defense right there in the name. Um, if we're just here to kick butt and we don't care about uh, whether or not, or, or sort of what goes into force being, uh, deciding whether or not using force is acceptable. We haven't gotten all the way there as, as moral people. And I, 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 I will allow for, oh uh, gosh, I've, I've never examined that. I've never really thought it all the way through. I'm not a philosopher. I just, you know, <clears throat> I'm just here lear learning about this stuff, but I mean, I take it as axiomatic that how you use martial arts matters more than how good your technique is. And so... Can you go a little deeper on that? That's well... Important, that's a strong statement. I want to hear more. I mean... You'd be hard pressed to find a mammal that is in some ways violent, right? Um, mm -hmm. They're all we're all effective at it to one degree or another, and uh, so humans being violent towards other humans or, or other or other animals is not something revolutionary. Martial artists didn't invent that. We're studying it. <clears throat> Part of the, the process of getting better at this, it was always taught to me, should be learning when and where and how to use it. In part, because I think martial arts teachers have an obligation to society to be uh, training people to be good citizens. But also, if we're teaching people self-defense, antisocial behavior, like antisocial violence, is not actually going to defend them or make their lives better. It's going to make their lives worse. 
not just because, you know, there are consequences from guys like me out there for, you know, antisocial violence, but also because people don't want to hang out with you. And one of the things that we as humans need is companionship. You're not going to live a happy, fulfilled life without it. And if no one can stand to be around you because you're a violent jerk, you're doing a poor job of defending yourself, no matter how good at violence you are. I'm, I'm just wondering, you know, because we we get, we got to start winding down here. Yep. But it's such a it's such a critical subject, and, and there's a a bit of an obvious answer mm-hmm. for folks listening if they want to go deeper. You know, you can go back to 579 when Andrew and I had the pleasure of talking to you and digging into this subject. But what about the experiential component? What about, because you, you've got plenty of time in, in, in a dojo mm-hmm. where, you know, I'm sure at 25 hours a week, you had plenty of time to, to dictate some of your own training, but you know, as well as I do and everyone else that, you know, if the instructor says we're doing it in this way, you're doing it in this way. But I can't imagine there aren't a few people who, whose interest has not been piqued especially with that strong, almost challenge that you issued. Mm -hmm. How might you suggest they take steps into understanding where those lines are as civilians? Well, um, in terms of just a, a normal... Uh, like academic study, uh, I would say the resources out uh, are out there for for folks to just dig into the topic and noodle around on it and and make sense of it. Um, it just, I mean, the the most basic uh, law of the land, uh, laws of the land, you know what what self-defense is just um as i as i told you guys the last time uh mostly uh contained in in jury instructions actually not not in not in uh, actual laws um uh the uh the reasonableness standard comes out of graham v connor so people can look up that case and the the legal meaning of it it's a, a federal case um and there's there's a ton of sort of modern academic resources um, that are that are out there freely available to anybody. But I would say that beyond that, um, as I mentioned before, martial arts training should incorporate this philosophical component. Um, And I think most do, most if not all do. We're not, it's not martial athletics. We're not uh, just kind of having fun. Um, It's not just an MMA gym, not just a boxing gym. Your dojo is a different place. And traditional martial arts, Everywhere that I've been, in every seminar that I've been to, um, learning side by side with teachers who are adding to what um, our instructor is telling us, uh, watching instructors and how they uh, lead their uh, their pupils through third party uh, instruction and. In my own dojo, every every place I've been, every dojo I've visited um, here and in Japan, they've all done the good work of getting people steeped in this in in the philosophies, the philosophies that. Uh, uh, spring up around the practice. Sensei Donahue uh, would say very frequently 
that it was always true that understanding martial arts made for more peaceful people. Um, he, he talked about um, his sensei who uh, was in the Vietnam War and his experience with um, some very, very highly trained elite soldiers uh, in the American military there. Um, and, and famous quotes from well-known um, martial artists and teachers all across the world uh, get at the same thing. Martial arts should make for a more peaceful person. I think that's as dramatic a statement as we can make about martial arts training. We say on the show quite often that I believe, I know Andrew's on, on board as well, that even six months of martial arts training makes someone better. I mean, helps them become a better version of themselves. But if we do look at martial arts from the lens of personal development, personal growth, which I do, I, I don't know that you do, I know many of our listeners do, that does become an inevitable aspect of that growth to become more peaceful. Which, Absolutely. You know, is, seem, seems so counter. And then no matter what angle, whether you go in it as looking at statements from law enforcement or military, whether those are, are um, soldiers or special forces, they all, well, not everyone, but it is easy to find people talking about essentially the same thing, that it requires competency in violence to truly appreciate and, and strive for peace. And yeah, it's a choice. You know, what's, what's that, that um, line, better to be a warrior in a garden than a gardener on a battlefield? Yep. There's so many ways we could take that. And so now, as we wind down, and this is where you are in your journey with your understanding, your experience as both martial artist and not only law enforcement, but an instructor of law enforcement in one of the aspects that relates to both subjects. If you were to go back, if you were to talk to you when you were younger, you know, a few years in, you, you started to have some capacity for violence. Are there things that you might tell yourself that those of us listening to you might be able to wrap our heads around that may inform our training our understanding our why wow uh, that is an enormous question um because, that is like, big. go big or go home okay <laughs> go big <laughs> and then go home no uh man young me was not good at a lot of things including thinking young me was not 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 great at thinking i uh, spent a lot of time thinking was what he thought was cool um, or thinking with uh, various non-brain body parts or and uh, sure would have liked him to have knocked that off though um, I, I suspect um, the mistakes made in those ways were part of the journey and sort of uh, indispensable um, if I could have gotten me to serious, disciplined, uh, intensive, immersive martial arts, where it was being taken seriously earlier on, nothing but good things would have come from that. Um, really, all of my lack of direction in life all of my laziness, all of my sort of follow the whims of today for today and worry about tomorrow, tomorrow, all of that stuff um, that I didn't really know I was doing. 
all of the self-destructive, addictive little habits. Those, I was able to overcome those all to the extent that I have and become a significantly better person just by getting to my martial arts training. It's really like, I could point to 101 different influences and people and things that I've seen and people that I looked up to and nothing, nothing, nothing was instrumental. It was as instrumental in making me into a, a better person. I mean, there's just, there's just no comparison. And yeah, I mean, I spent a, a lot of good time at a lot of good schools, um, high school, college, spent a lot of good time around very, very smart people, uh, tried to encourage me to think and tried to show me how, but um, it really took Sensei Donahue and his practice to uh, turn that crank over, to start the engine of um, sacrificing what I wanted right now for who I wanted to be in the future. So, uh, I don't know. Can I make it pithy, high thee to a good dojo? Would that, uh, would, would that have been enough? <laughs> maybe you you approach it in a few different directions there which means it's going to land differently for different people and, and i'm sure you reached more of them in that way yeah yeah like i don't i mean that that was the advice that i needed mm -hmm. young young me bad decision maker um was never going to get past uh, those flaws, those character flaws, without um, without the experience that I had in the dojo. It just wasn't going to happen. It's a lot to unpack there. Yeah. And my encouragement to people listening is that there are likely parts of this, if not the whole thing, that if you're if you're listening, if you're feeling like you want to go deeper, like there's more, like you need more, listen to it again. It's the beauty of podcasts when you just hit rewind. Don't doesn't cost extra. In this case, it's still free. <laughs> um, if people want to get messages to you, is there a, is there a way we can do that without? Putting you out there too far? Uh, Can they route them through us? Sure. Um, okay. uh, yeah, I mean, and I uh, confess that as I, uh, as I was sort of looking around at, at uh, I looked down at my schedule uh, for this, this recording today, I was, you know, oh yeah, so uh, we where last we left last we left off, and I, I went back to, um, you know, the things that I, I noted in our last conversation, and I, I sort of had this, you know, a couple of things. Oh, we didn't go over this. We didn't talk about that. I had this other story to tell, or whatever. Um, I didn't know I was going to be talking about myself quite so much, and uh, <laughs> um, I sort of wasn't sure if we were going back to those notes or if you wanted me to talk about myself or, or if there's some other questions in particular that you had, but I thought that um, it might be fun sometime in the future that if people have questions for a resource like me, um, mm. I'd be happy to sit down with you guys and answer those or do my best to answer them. Or not, you know, Actually, I think that, I think that would be good. That kind of gives us like a, like a three part series in a, in a sense. So yes. let, let me let me do that to all of you listeners. Let me let me challenge you. Are there questions on this subject that you want to ask Sergeant Hamilton? Email me, Jeremy at whistlekick.com. Let's let's collect a number of them. Of course, we would 
get them to him ahead of time. We would not do what Andrew does to me on the Q&A episodes. We wouldn't uh, ambush him with those questions. But I, I think that could be really informative and interesting. I, I, I certainly have a number of questions that, that I could ask. Yeah. So um, start, the, start emailing me and we'll get those together and we'll, we'll figure that out. I'm sorry about that. Uh, one thing just I'll say about that, uh, despite my position and um, this, despite, you know, like being a police officer and a supervisor and he's a force instructor, I um, fairly steadfastly keep my head and my nose out of the news about um, questionable police uses of force uh. around the um yes not we we, not, we won't step into anything that is that any of that um well no so i'm happy to answer questions about stuff like that um, i don't want to answer questions about that because that no. that nobody somebody's always unhappy yes i some, you know is generally going to be unhappy with those things yeah i, um, I don't want to do episodes where we know half the people are going to be unhappy yes okay um what I was going to say is that if if people, oh, please I, I step, I I keep myself away from those things because, um, frankly, uh, I mean I, I don't sleep very well at night. Uh, when I when I expose myself to too much of that stuff, and it's yeah. just not great for my health, it's not good for my own personal self defense. Uh, so if if at some point people are going to start asking me questions about, well, what do you think of what happened in this case or, you know, that guy and what, did you see this video? I'm going to need to hear about that ahead of time because I try not to watch the news. I don't, I mean, I'm trying to keep my blood pressure someplace reasonable. I don't, I don't blame you. Yeah. Yeah. Do not blame me at all. I get it. As, I guess as much as I can not being in your position. Yeah, I have to I have to worry about uh, signing off on on our uses of force when we when we have them, and that is plenty, mm. plenty, plenty. But yeah, we'll, we'll we'll talk and we'll circle Andrew and we'll, we'll we'll figure something out. But but folks listening, yeah, if you've if you've got questions, if there's stuff that that we could bring to Sergeant Hamilton, I think that could be a really cool episode. And, um, so yeah, yeah, send me some stuff. Let's close up. So final words. You know, this this can be doesn't doesn't have to be poignant or pithy or or uh come from any particular direction, but you know, I'll record an outro later that we'll stack on top of this. So what what are your final words? You 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 know what the people have heard today because you said it. How do you want to close out with them? Um, well, thank you for listening to me talk. Uh so I hope uh, me talking about myself was interesting to other people. I hope I didn't come off as too egotistical, um, despite the fact that I'm a little bit egotistical. Uh, I uh, don't, uh, I don't know. Yeah, there's nothing, there's no sort of pithy poignant advice that I have here um, other than, than I guess. Um, uh, be attentive to um, what you're using your martial arts for. Keep in mind what uh, the training is there for, what it's supposed to be doing for you. What What is it adding to your life and why is it doing that? I really appreciate Sergeant Hamilton coming back and being willing to talk more, not only on the subject we had him on for 579, talking about force and, and violence and such, but more so getting to know a bit about him. I think it's really important for us to understand how martial arts can set us up for so many things. It's almost like whatever you do, martial arts makes it better or prepares you better, or in a lot of cases, opens doors that may not have been opened prior. Thanks for coming on again. I hope we get to connect in person soon, and thank you for what you do. To those of you listening, thank you for what you do, namely supporting the show, even if it's by listening to the show. 
But if you want to help us stick around, if you want to help us grow, reach more and bigger guests, expand our reach and make positive impact on the martial arts world, there's a lot you can do. Start at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com, dig through the show notes, get to know today's guest better, sign up for the newsletter, see the, all, all the other things that we got going on. And then if you're willing to support us, remember, you could share this episode with somebody who maybe needs to hear it. You could leave a review somewhere. You could tell a friend about what we've got going on at Whistlekick, or maybe support the Patreon, patreon.com slash whistlekick. And don't forget, we've got four really well thought out, amazing training protocols for martial artists. Guess what? I wrote them, got some help, but most of them came from my understanding, my research, my teaching over decades. If you want to get stronger or faster or more flexible or build your conditioning, go to whistlekick.com, check out our training programs. Don't forget, also, we've got that code, Podcast15, gets 15% off. Yes, it works on those training programs. And of course, if you have guest suggestions, topic suggestions, feedback in general, if you want to reach out, get at me, jeremy at whistlekick.com. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.